Okay, here we are. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, in, in this, what, what appears to be a strange round table, we don't usually hold these um, like that because it is a, a content, almost a content-free round table um, where we are coming together with schol scholars around the world to commemorate people that we have lost um, the past three years and we didn't have the opportunity to name them, acknowledge their contributions, share stories. Um, when, we, when we are able to get together uh, more regularly, the list of people that we have to mentally say goodbye to is usually uh, shorter. But in this instance, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult um, year because we have to honor well, we're here to honor several colleagues, um, Emil Bruno and Martin Heisler, my computer is freezing, Bob Jervis, Herbert Kelman. I, I think I got it to work. Is this better? Okay, all right, okay. Um, Cheryl Koopman, Sam McFarland, Jim Sidanius, and Jerry Post. Um, we have uh, colleagues with us, we have Rebecca Wolf, and we also have Ruthie Pertis, and they are here to say a few words. I also have a couple of testimonies from um, colleagues that I will read um, to you because, because of time differences, they could not join us virtually. It's very, very early in the morning where they are. Um, Christy Monroe has sent um, her note, and Linda Trope. And I'll be reading these out. I'll put them up there, and you will be able to see them. Um, what I wanted to do is just go um, around the panel of colleagues that we have here, and everybody can introduce themselves and tell us a couple of words of what they will be talking about, and then maybe we can, we can start. This is an opportunity to share stories as well. So this is not just for us to do the talking. It's also for you um, to bring in some insights. Uh, Leonie, you want to go? Uh, yeah, so I'm Leonie Huddy. Um, I knew quite a few of these people. I've been involved in this society for a long time and, and in political psychology for a long time. But Teresa had asked me to speak specifically about Bob Jervis. So, but I may say a few words about Jim, although I'm sure Jim Sedanius Felicia will say even more than me. And I knew Cheryl Koopman. I obviously knew Sam McFarland and Jerry Post. So we'll see how our conversation goes, but I have most to say about Bob. Hi, I'm, I'm Felicia Prado, and I was asked to come and talk a little bit about Jim Sedanius, so I'll do that. But I'm missing all the other people we've, we are commemorating here, too. Hi, I'm, I'm Katarzyna Hammer. I'm going to talk about Sam McFarland. I guess, is it our turn then at this point? Uh, so my name is Ruthie Pertzis, and I'll be talking about um, some of my memories and, and thoughts uh, about uh, Gerald, Dr. Gerald Post. Rebecca? And some of that. Rebecca, can you, can you repeat this? Because we didn't cut any of it. It cuts out. Are you on? Um, are you on headphones? Take them off and. No, I was no, it works. Try okay. Um, yeah. It. So I'll be. I'm Rebecca Wolf. I'll be talking about Herb Kelman. Rebecca, do you want to uh, go ahead and start? And we'll do it. Maybe we'll do it in reverse order. Yeah. Okay. Again, the mic is acting up. I'll take, I, okay. it, these tend to go badly. Just give me a moment. I'm good. I'll go to the speaker. That tends to be more consistent. Is it working now? Okay. Hopefully okay. my dog won't interrupt us. Um, so um, 
thank you um, again for including me today and giving me the opportunity to share some memories about Herb. Um, I was deeply honored that Linda suggested, Linda Trop suggested, Teresa, that I speak today to commemorate Herb's memory. Um, throughout Herb's career, he supported and encouraged inter interdisciplinary work and was an active member of many such interdisciplinary societies, including being president of ISPP in 1977. Since her past, I reread or, or read for the first time many of his writings. Numerous things have stood out, many of which I'll outline in my remarks. But perhaps, and what has stood out most is how much Herb did not com compartmentalize. Um, I had read Lin Linda's um, reflections that um, Teresa will read in a bit, um, but she notes in her remarks that um, he was a kind man and he was extremely kind. He believed the best in everyone. And returning to his writings, I'm reminded that his kindness was in inextricably linked with his commitment to treating everyone with dignity and believing people could change. His work, his actions, and those of his partner and wife of 67 years, Rose Bozeman, who I'm sure many of you have met at conferences over the years, um, were all centered on dignity, justice, and social change. Through reading and reflection these last months, I'm reminded how much Herb has shaped me in my career, uh, perhaps a process of internalization, again, where there was little distinction between Herb's research and actions. Um, those reflections have also reminded me of what I wanna do more of, how to live my life more completely. I've synthesized these reminders into 10 lessons Herb taught me and others over his long career. Um, the first one is remember where you came from. When Herb would write or discuss the development of his own research, the evolution of the psychological study of war and peace, the founding of the Journal of Conflict Resolution, or many other endeavors over his career, he always situated these endeavors as part of a long lineage. For example, I do not think he ever wrote about his tripartite theory of social influence without mentioning his doctoral advisor, Carl Hovland, and the influence Carl had on his work. When discussing the psychology of war and peace, he placed his contributions with others such as Ralph K. White, Kenneth Boulding, Warden Deutsch, and many others. This reverence for those who shape the field and in turn his own work is indicative, I believe, of his deep, deep commitment to treat people with dignity. By recognizing their contributions, he shined a light on them as individuals. After his passing, Kristen Olson remarked on Twitter how during her PhD, she would meet with her regularly and he would share stories about the people who developed the field. In shining that light on these individuals' contributions, he acknowledged that he and us were part of a larger community, the other element in his definition of dignity. Seeing these connections across both time and space helped him build interdisciplinary institutes and societies. It's also a reminder that you are not doing this work alone. We are part of something bigger. The second lesson is know when to hold on, know when to let go. Herb said this about himself in one of his last conversations with me. I've been spending the year at Yale and would go to Jen Richardson's lab meetings. In that conversation, we reflected about the fact that when I tried to drop out of the program, he refused. He would only sign a leave of absence form. However, when Jen decided to switch to having Nalini and Body as her main advisor, he was supportive and remained an active member of her committee. He understood Nally could help Jen achieve her goals in a way her put in. Of course, for someone who spent 30 years working on what many consider an intractable conflict may think he wasn't good at letting go. But I think this is where the difference is. He knew when to let go when it was best for that individual or group to support their dignity, for them to become who they wanted to be. But he didn't give up on people, whether it was about a struggling student or ending years of struggle between groups. The third lesson is to take action. Her model throughout his life, the importance of taking action to fight injustice and to promote a more just and peaceful world. From when he was a boy in Europe and then America, joining a Zionist youth group or fighting for civil rights on the lunch counters in Baltimore and being an active member of CORE, the Congress of, of Racial Equality, to his actions as a CEO during Vietnam and posting, 
protesting nuclear war, and of course his years organizing, facilitating interactive problem working, problem solving workshops, and then writing regularly in the Boston Globe to support the peace process. I'll say more about being a scholar practitioner later, but I think especially now when many of us are distraught and overwhelmed overwhelmed by the injustice we see in the world, Herb's example of taking action is a reminder that it is our responsibility to act. The fourth lesson is to, he underscored the social and social psychology. Um, again, in Linda's remarks, um, she recounts a story of her meeting Charles Blumstein on the train after a conference of conscientious objectioners and how that solidified his belief that social psychology was the discipline that could most effectively promote peace and justice. While he recognized the importance of systems and institutions, he also recognized that people were the ones to change those systems and institutions, and therefore why much of his work was focused on attitude and behavior change. He also recognized how the social environment influenced people's behavior. Torture, genocide, and other crimes of obedience could in part be explained by the legitimization of dehumanization. And that legitimization was held up by systems and institutions that were part of people's social environment. Herb wrote about how the social part of social psychology gives psychology context, recognizing that people live within a social context and and helps understand the influence context has on individual groups. You can't understand people unless you understand their context. Before I continue, I'll take a moment to say a bit about my background. As um, I was a student of Herb's, actually his last student. Before returning to academia a couple of years ago, uh, I'm now at University of Chicago, I worked for an international development and humanitarian agency for about 15 years. I say this since much of my work involved designing peace building programs for specific contexts, Sri Lanka, Yemen, Zimbabwe, um, many others. And it was this sensitivity to the social part of social psychology and understand the context people lived in that made me better in designing peace building interventions. Most people know that they need to be context specific, but it was hard for many to articulate what that actually meant in practice. The tools of social psychology, which Herb emphasized, helped me think through what about the context influenced people's behavior and what may be in fact generalizable about people and how to use both to promote peace. Lesson five, importance of relationships. The love between Herb and Rose was something of storybooks. I can still hear Rose say Herbie. Um, and the obituary Herb wrote for Rose in the Boston Globe is beautiful, a true love letter. Herb and Rose showed the world what love and partnership could be. But this lesson is more about his tripartite theory of social influence, the theory that underpinned his work on obedi obedience, his work on nationalism and identity, on conflict resolution, and on research ethics. Influence could come through three mechanisms, compliance, identification, and internalization. Many theories of attitude change are dichotomous, focusing on processes that loosely align with compliance and internalization. But I think in this simplification, the important aspect of influence and attitude change is lost. The importance of relationship, how identification with others influences our attitudes and behavior. Herb suspected it was identification that led to the most sustainable attitude change. While he never tested it directly, based on what we know about norms and attitude change, I suspect he was right. Norms are influential in part because it is how we infer what our group believes. Because we care about our relationships to the group, we align with those norms, how Herb thought about identification. It was also through meaningful contact across conflict lines, people may start that process of identification, change their attitudes towards one another, valuing those intergroup relationships and behaving in a way in, in a way that supported the relationship. He designed the interactive problem solving workshops with that in mind. And it was with that in mind, I designed various contact based programs in my applied work, what would help people value intergroup relationships where they identified with them in ways and so that their actions were supportive of those relationships. Lesson six, where and how to intervene the connections between micro and macro processes. 
in the peace building field, I've seen two broad approaches. The first focuses on microprocesses of behavior and attitude change, and either assumes it will ladder up or ignore the issue of macro processes since it's out of their control. The other isn't really an approach, but a critiques. So much is out of our control, uh, out of the control of individuals and communities. Why bother thinking about macro processes? Herb showed us how to design microprocesses in a way that could influence macro processes by being intentional and explicit about if and how they could connect, while also recognizing the limits in microprocesses, how it limits in how microprocesses could influence macro processes. For the interactive problem solving workshops, Herb was intentional about who was invited to participate, as while why they attended the workshop as in, and as while they attended the workshop as individuals, they were influential in their respective societies. So there would be opportunities for eyes generated at the workshop to spread particularly upward towards decision makers. While Herb was naive and Naya acknowledged he could not prove causality, over the years he collected evidence about how those who participated in the workshops influenced the larger Israeli-Palestinian peace process. He understood if he designed if programs were designed appropriately, microprocesses could lead to macro change. What is key is connecting micro, what is key in connecting micro and macro processes is intention. For example, many contact programs are criticized for not having wider societal influence, but they were never designed to have that wider influence. If that is the goal, like the goal of the interactive problem solving workshop, is to lead to larger societal change, contact programs need to be designed with that in mind. Is the contact public who participates? Are the leaders or others that are influential? How long and sustained is the contact? How diverse are the situations involving contact? There are multiple pathways for contact to spread. Program designers need to think about how it may spread when constructing programs. What Herb showed us is that there, it is possible to map those pathways and design programs to utilize those pathways. Lesson seven, have patience. Related to the above lesson, the influence of microprocesses on ma macro processes take time. It may not be linear. There may be bumps, many bumps in the road, but with time and persistence, it can happen. Lesson eight, how to be a scholar practitioner. Herb was the consummate scholar practitioner. He believed strongly in the Lewin tenet that there's nothing as practical as good theory. For him, that meant working in both spaces simultaneously as only through practice could he make theory more relevant and through more relevant theories improve practice. Herb's modeling of what it meant to be a scholar practitioner has remained essential in my own work. I very much use social psychological theories in designing peace building programs. Uh, initially, my career I was focused on the practice side, but later I returned to scholarship and was able to examine rigorously how contact worked in the midst of active intermunal conflict in Nigeria. From that work, I further developed theory for how contact may lead to societal change, which we continue to test and refine through the interplay between program design, implementation, and research. It's this work Herb was extremely proud of. In our last conversations, he would tear up and tell me repeatedly how proud he was that I was doing exactly what I came to grad school for, and I could do it because he showed me how. Lesson nine, the gift of dignity. As I mentioned earlier, I've been rereading much of Herb's work. In his Kurt Lewin memorial address at APA in 1973, he asked what it means to perceive another person as fully human in the sense of being included in the moral compact that governs, governs human relationships. I'm paraphrasing here, but he answered his own questions by saying it meant according them identity and community. A hit on the connection between dignity, identity, and community above in discussing how Herb honored the past and mentored his grad students in ways that suited them, not according to what he needed. Herb and Rose's work and action underscored the importance of dignity. I bring up Rose here as for those who knew them, knew how Rose took care of those forgotten and, and in her photo photography was able to capture their dignity. She has, she also showed how much she respected each person's dignity and how she fostered relationships related to the workshops. Her, both in his early writing and again more so in his later writing, discussed the, import, 
discussed the importance of dignity. In his piece about legitimization, he discussed how a junior faculty member, he's, um, as a junior faculty member, he spoke up to preserve the dignity of grad students who feel who felt pressured by senior faculty to take LSD during the years Tim Leary was at Harvard, and how um, he and I saw how he continued to do that for students and other faculty during my years at Harvard. It was it was what led him to stand up for civil rights and getting arrested for. Um, sorry, it. Um, it, this commitment to dignity led him to stand up for civil rights, um, even getting arrested um, in trying to um, preserve people's dignity, dignity. It's what made him a Zionist, having watched his dignity and those of his family and neighbors undermined in the lead up to the Holocaust. And it is what greatly disturbed him, watching the dignity of Palestinians being undermined by Israeli policies and practices. I believe this commitment to preserving people's dignity, which developed at a young age, drew her to social psychology to understand the full person in their environment, environment and evaluating each person, encouraging them to pursue their goals, even if it meant letting go. He still believed in, in them. In writing this, I realized this lesson, the gift of dignity, helped me take care of my dad as he was dying. I did all I could to preserve his di dignity, even if it took more time, even if I would have to do it again later. He would thank me repeatedly for taking such good care of it, him. And I think what he meant is that I allowed him to have dignity despite the fact that he was dying. It is what I'm most grateful for during that time. And I thank her for teaching me the importance of treating everyone with dignity. Lesson 10, how to, hope, how, how to have hope in trying times. Herb called himself a strategic optimist. He would joke that he added strategic to the um, as a adjective to optimist to fit in with the IR people at the Center for International Affairs. But to me, Herb role modeled how to have hope despite dark times. His belief that people could change, that peace and justice was possible, um, that he didn't give up on protracted conflicts. I was finishing my dissertation during 2002. Part of my dissertation was on the workshops. When I analyzed transcripts from various workshops to understand how changes in the larger context influenced what happened within the workshop. I was writing at the time when the second Antifada gained strength. Yet despite that many had lost hope in reading the transcripts, I maintained hope. I could see how over the course of 25 years, how Israelis and Palestinians discussed the conflict had changed significantly. They understood they were stuck with each other. Herb, Herb taught me how to see the, that change and those possibilities. I mentioned how he taught me to have hope in the acknowledgments of my dissertation. During grad school, I suffered from two fairly debilitating depressions. It was during that first one I tried to drop out of the program um, and Herb wouldn't let me. Herb showed me how to have hope despite the darkness, which helped me get through it. And when darkness comes, his hope, his strategic optimism continues to be my light. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you for what is not just a wonderful um, account and memory of a mentor, but also um, a personal story. And it comes through, so it's, uh, thank you for sharing it. It makes us all a little um, richer. Um, Ruthie, you wanna take the floor? Sure, can everyone hear me? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, great. Uh, well, Rebecca, that was, that was fantastic. Um, I, I wish I had now come up with uh, maybe a similar sort of list um, are there issues with the screen there? Sorry, I'm, I'm fiddling with the screen. Okay. Uh, but we, well, I can see you, but the audience cannot. But we can hear you fine. Okay, great. Well, I'll just uh, I'll just keep going then. <clears throat> I uh, oh, yeah. I think I see myself there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I, I hope everyone's uh, having a lovely time in Greece. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there. Uh, actually, my my Google photos are popping up now from Portugal. Uh, from three years ago, which was a really fantastic, uh, a fantastic meeting, <clears throat> and so um, I'm I'm glad to be here. I have to admit, uh, despite the fact that I've presented at ISPP, been to ISPP many times, 
presented at ISPP many times and uh, taught over Zoom uh, the last two years, I, I feel nervous uh, right now. And I, I felt nervous last night. Uh, I, I had trouble sleeping because things kept coming to mind and I wondered um, if I would get everything in. So I, I'm nervous because I've I've never really commemorated someone in public uh, like this before. Um, I'm nervous because I I still can't believe um, that that uh, Dr. Post is gone. So uh, he insisted that I call him Jerry. I think most people do, but I I, I could never do it. I, I never got around to it. So uh, so Dr. Post, uh, it stays for me. Um, it, it's still hard for me to to. Uh, process that uh, that he's not with us anymore, um, and I'm nervous because uh, 10 minutes is is not enough time uh, to say everything that I want to say and and uh, get it all out there. And and I, I'm sure I'll forget uh, many important things, um, but but such it is. Uh, the the plan I I know that some of those being commemorated uh, in this meeting today uh, also have a longer uh, commemoration, uh, sort of a, a a full slot this year. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that there um, there are plans for for uh, such a meeting uh, or such a discussion uh, next year in hopefully in person in Montreal uh, at the next ISPP meeting. Um, so first, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to 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 look at this uh, discussion in in the larger context. So the the all of those being commemorated uh, in this in this meeting today. And I was uh, looking through their profiles, many, many, uh, many of them, I, of course, I'm familiar with their work, uh, but just reading through them, and I was struck by uh, the similarities uh, among the scholars that we're commemorating today, uh, the similarities between them uh, and Dr. Post. I mean, I think about um, Emile Bruno's work uh, on the cognitive and social underpinnings of violence and conflict, uh, his his understandings of the images of the other and dehumanization. Um, again, very very much related to the work that Dr. Post uh, was doing, specifically this idea of the other. Um, Martin Heisler talking about the importance of social and political contexts in the development of identities. Um, also, such a big part of what Dr. Post uh, always did was really in in creating profiles of leaders, really looking at. Uh, the importance of the social and political context in, in which um, sort of they, they developed. Uh, Bob Jervis, uh, studies of, of uh, leader decision making and the importance of leaders in the international system, um, who also had a very strong policy focus, which of course Dr. Post did as well. Um, Herb Kelman, as Rebecca uh, so nicely uh, outlined, uh, and, and I have in quotes here a scholar practitioner, uh, because that's what comes up in, in descriptions of of him uh, and his work, and, and specifically um, his work with Arab, Israeli and Arab leaders, uh, similar again to, to Dr. Post's work with the Camp David Accords. Uh, Cheryl Koopman, um, some of her work on the social, and, again, social and political context of health specifically uh, makes me think of the work uh, that Dr. Post did on uh, the health of, of leaders. So, so when leaders are ill and what imp influence that has uh, on, on domestic and international society. Uh, I also found uh, something uh, about an organization uh, that, that she was involved with. Um, maybe someone on the panel can, can provide some more context there, but uh, the psychologist for social responsibility. So I talk a little bit about um, again Dr. Post and most recent, uh, most recently his his uh, his, his feelings um, about about um, the former U.S. president and and his his need his his moral responsibility to to stand up and say something. So I'll I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, Sam McFarland's early work on authoritarianism, again, really sort of reminiscent of a lot of the work that that Dr. Post was doing, uh, and, and Jim Sedanius, the, the the work, his work on the psychology of political extremism and terrorism, and also on on group conflict. So, in in looking at these um, eight individuals, I was I was uh, I guess I I shouldn't have been surprised by the similarities. Um, uh, in, in the type of work that they did, um, but also the, the one main similarity, uh, essentially using, using their brilliance for good, uh, using their ability uh, to work as hard as they did for, for good, 
uh, in in so many different ways in so many different contexts. Um, and I I I suspect um, strongly that Dr. Post would be honored to be commemorated uh, with all of these people, uh, and that they would be honored to be commemorated uh, with him as well. Um, and, and you know, in this context of ISPP, just to highlight again the 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 obvious uh, how much uh, Dr. Post loved ISPP, and uh, he you know he called it his intellectual home, uh, and because of him. I and many, many others feel the same way. I think I, you know, I tagged along for the first time in, in 2011 um, and, uh, and, and just saw how, how much he loved the environment uh, and, how much, and how much he was loved there. And so um, just, a, a really, uh, just a, really, a really nice, nice thought there. Um, so, I mean, we can talk about uh, we can talk about his you know impressive biography, Yale, Harvard, and and NIH and CIA. Um, <clears throat> how he he really changed our understandings of leaders and and political violence. Um, but but I think everybody already knows that. Um, I, I think there are probably uh, most people in the room there. I, I can't see who's there, but I would guess uh, that many knew him even longer than I did and knew. Uh, knew of his work and of um, of his influence and his brilliance long before I did. So uh, you know, I, I'd rather take a few minutes uh, and, and talk about him him as a person uh, again because I, I think we're all pretty pretty familiar uh, with the work. And so a, a few of the things that I I really wanted to highlight um, again I, I was <laughs> I had trouble sleeping last night because things kept coming to mind and I and I. I really wanted to hone in uh, on some of those those really uh, key elements there, and I guess um, so. As I, I as I mentioned, um, this sort of uh, sense of moral obligation and and you know this this fearlessness. Um, I know that uh, you know the APA, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, with with this Goldwater rule uh, about psychiatrists not providing any diagnoses of of leaders uh, that they have not uh, been in contact with. And I know that it, it was a struggle uh, for many, many years uh, for Dr. Post, but especially uh, with um, the election of, of Donald Trump. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I know that um, he just had such a hard time uh, wrapping his head around that. And he had such a hard time staying silent uh, about what he thought was a, a, a major, uh, major issue and, and a, a huge danger to the country and to the world. Uh, and this, you know, this this um, th this feeling that he just couldn't stay silent, uh, and ultimately didn't, uh, and, and it cost him a lot uh, professionally and and reputationally uh, in some in some ways. Um, but I think that 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 was not what was for for at, at the forefront of his mind. Um, he really felt that he needed to say something, that he needed to do something. Uh, and, and he did, and, and I, I, you know, I think he was proud of himself for doing it. I think everyone uh, who who knows him uh, was proud of him for doing that, and recognized how difficult that was. Uh, but that was just, you know, the most recent example of of this uh, again, this sense of moral obligation, and, and use what he did and what he knew um, for for the greater good. <clears throat> um, next, also, also this. Uh, I couldn't. I, I couldn't quite think of the word here. I don't know if it's uh, relevance or, or, or timelessness, um, but I feel like every time something, you know, something breaks in the news, the first person I want to call is Dr. Post. I think everyone that I've spoken to, uh, you know, in the last few months, um, they all say the same thing. Well, what would he say about Putin? And what would he be saying about Russia right now? And, and everyone just tries to imagine, um, you know, what what he would have to say. Because he had such insightful, uh, insightful takes uh, on 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 the most current events, and um, I, I just uh, like I said, I, I just everyone I talk to, um, and and I myself, I see something in the news, I wanna I wanna call him and talk to him about it and get his take on it, uh, and I you know I, I think that will always be the case uh, because he 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 studied and shed light on such interesting and important. Uh, issues in the international system uh, and you know new leaders come up and new organizations come up and so I'll always 
uh, I and others will always wonder what, what would Dr. Post have to say about this. Um, and I guess uh, finally, and, and along the lines of what, what Rebecca so nicely highlighted uh, about, about Herb Kelman, uh, was, the, was Dr. Post's mentoring of young people, of young scholars. Um, so I was a student uh, of Dr. Post at, at GW and then went to work with him for several years. Um, and young people, young scholars loved, loved working with him. He was so supportive. Uh, any spark of an idea, uh, you know, led to encouragement to write a paper about it, to, to submit to ISPP. I mean, I think he single-handedly <laughs> probably, uh, you know, contributed to much of the population uh, of ISPP because he was so encouraging. Um, he loved sharing credit for work, uh, you know, and any time students contributed uh, to any of the research that went into his work, he, he was the first to, to suggest putting their name on it, uh, often putting their names first. Um, and, you know, again, pushing young scholars to write and to present. Um, and and I, I finished uh, grad school only this past summer and see how important that is, uh, how, how important it is to have someone like that. I, I've heard good stories and not so good stories about mentors. Um, and I guess, um, the, what I would take away from this, if there, if there are young people, young scholars there in the room, uh, that, that they should be looking for a mentor like him. Uh, and for those in the room who are mentors, uh, we need more mentors who were like him. Uh, I, I remember that when I told him uh, that I wanted to study language in international relations, which is quite far from what he does. Um, he, he summoned everyone he could think of that might be able to help diplomats and, and ambassadors and anyone who could, who could say anything uh, to, to, to help me in my process. Uh, and even when I, when I told him that I was going to go to grad school, um, he just got in touch with everyone he could uh, and, and uh, helped me on that path. And so it, that the importance of mentoring, I just, I can't overstate uh, and, and again, I mean, taking it or bringing it back to all of those um, being commemorated today, I noticed that all of them had uh, mention uh, of, of their mentoring on, on their um, memorial pages or their, their, um, their university websites. Uh, they have that same quality. I, I read, you know, for, for each and every one of them. How, how much the mentoring they provided to their students uh, meant to those students. And that doesn't surprise me that they also shared this quality. Um, I don't know, maybe there's something about being a political psychologist that just, uh, that, that just lends itself to, to that type of supportive uh, mentoring. Um, but I'll, I'll end uh, by saying that, um, so, so uh, Dr. Post passed away uh, on November 22nd, 2020, which was sort of uh, right in the thick of COVID. Uh, I couldn't go to the funeral. Most, of course, uh, most people were, were unable. Uh, but I did go to the unveiling of his tombstone about a month ago. Um, and he's, he's buried in the uh, Garden of Remembrance Cemetery in Clarksburg, Maryland. And so on his tombstone um, are, you know, are just the words, Gerald Post, kind, gentle, indomitable. Uh, and so if we, we think of the word indomitable, so impossible to subdue or defeat, uh, I think that that really uh, summarizes him as a person and as a scholar um, in the sort of in the in the uh, later stages uh, of his life. Um, he, he was suffering from kidney issues. Uh, and I, I think he, he really just thought that that was another um, another another thing, another, you know, he had, he had gone through other issues and, and uh, shoulder replacements or, or hip replacements or whatever it was. I think he was um, really sure that, you know, a kidney, a kidney transplant would come uh, at any moment. And he was working on his next projects and he was planning a trip to India, um, according to his wife, Carolyn, who, who I think many people know. Um, and so, so that, um, Certainly, it was impossible to subdue or defeat him. Uh, and, and even uh, as Carolyn, as Carolyn uh, told me, that the, the doctors and the nurses uh, told her. So, I mean, just in the very last days, the very last days of his life in the hospital, 
um, he was teaching the nurses and the doctors about the Goldwater rule and why it was so important to, to, to share the knowledge that we have. And again, this moral obligation. Um, and so I knew him for, for um, just about 11 or 12 years, as I, as I suggested, I think many of you knew him much longer and have more stories and more experiences uh, of him and with him. Uh, but but I would say indomitable is really uh, is really just the right word, um, and that's that's where I'll leave it. So I, I just wanted to you know to, Teresa keeps thanking us uh, for for participating in this and and for for you know joining by Zoom. But we should really be thanking her and uh, the ISPP for allowing us uh, a, a space to to commemorate. Um, and and it's it's a really fantastic opportunity, and I, I look forward to to hearing uh, any other uh, thoughts or, or memories or, or anything like that. And I again appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and and as Rebecca said, I, I'm honored that that I was asked uh, to to provide this commemoration. And um, I'm already thinking of things that I should have said that I've already that I forgot to say, and those will keep coming, I'm sure. Um, but. Thanks again, and I, I appreciate this opportunity. Ruthie, thank you so much for um, making these memories public and, and these, uh, these voices, I guess these, these words um, heard. Um, I have a memory of you um, with Jerry coming to the Summer Academy when yeah. Jerry was giving his lecture. And I, I was running the academy at the time. And the 40 students that we had in the room, we were tell, telling them they were invited to ISPP for the first time. They were, they were trying to learn what ISPP is all about. And I remember people not just talking about his presentation, but talking about his mentorship. And mm -hmm. people saying how um, ISPP looks after um, the, you know, they're young. Um, and I think it wasn't just him leading by example, it was you as well. And, and I know people were talking about this afterwards, the commitment, the, the mutual support, the fantastic cooperation in delivering something that changed a lot of how people understand uh, political psychology. So thank you for being here and sharing thank these um, things today. Katharina, thank do you want to take so the floor? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Katarzyna Hammer, and uh, I'm honored to be invited. Thank you, Teresa, again. And I'm honored to say that uh, I work with Sam, and um, he was my mentor and a friend. Sam was a very special per person, much loved, uh, not only by his family, but also friends and uh, colleagues, and many of us in ISPP. Um, and I will start from um, a bit more formal introduction for people who, do, who don't know him um, and finish with a little bit uh, less formal. Uh, so Sam was uh, a social and political psychologist. Uh, he stayed at uh, Western Kentucky University uh, for his career 
Uh, he was named a distinguished university professor there. Uh, he was also a Fulbright senior scholar in the former Soviet Union uh, uh, around the time that Berlin Wall collapsed. Uh, he was also former president of our uh, um, uh, society, 2009-2010. Um, and he was very active in ISPP, uh, took part in many initiatives and commissions, committees. Uh, for example, he was a member of uh, the editorial board of political psychology uh, and other um, um, committees. And as a result, he was awarded um, uh, for service in 2001. His early research focused on prejudice authoritarianism, like it was mentioned already today, and psychology of religion. But in recent years, his research and writing have focused on identification with all humanity and human rights, and this is where we have met. Um, human rights were very important for some. Uh, uh, he um, wrote a lot of papers about it, uh, also from um, empirical papers and review papers, uh, also from a cultural point of view, looking at different countries, different cultures, um, uh, in very different um, journals, as you can see. Um, he also uh, published a book this year. Uh, it was published actually right after he passed away in J January. Uh, Heroes of Human Rights. Uh, I was um, able to see some chapters before they were published uh, already, and uh, um, they are very interesting because Sam is looking at biographies in this book, biographies of people who were heroes of human rights, uh, looking uh, also at what um, pushed them to fight for human rights, what inspired them. It's very interesting. Um, don't have time to look more into it, but uh, I recommend the book very much. Sam has uh, taught human rights uh, also for more than 20 years, and he prepared open access paper, uh, which uh, he wanted to spread. Um, um, so I, I'm also talking about it because it's uh, free from our website. You can download it and use to teach, to learn human rights. This is a, a beginning overview of human rights for college level uh, readers. So please feel free to, uh, to use it. Sam would be very happy that you do. Uh, Sam also served uh, on APA Task Force on Human Rights. Uh, the APA uh, Task Force uh, was created after the, um, or in response to some psychologists helping uh, with uh, tortures in Afghanistan and Guantanamo, uh, like Sam said that, and uh, uh, it was uh, as a response and uh, a way to deal with uh, the whole situation. Uh, Sam is also the author of Identification with All Humanity uh, concept and the scale. Um, maybe you already heard about it, I hope. It's uh, uh, the idea that people who are uh, identified with all humanity feel uh, bond uh, and concern for people all over the world, care for them, no matter what ethnicity, nationality, gender, um, and whatever else, religion. Um, so just feeling uh, close to people all over, all, all over the world. Uh, and he also wrote uh, a lot of papers about it, uh, starting from, for example, Journal of uh, Personality and Social Psychology, but also many others, uh, some um, in cooperation with me also, which I'm very proud of. Um, and uh, I would like also to talk about this one, because this is a... Uh, um, part of uh, Sam's magic. He, um, this is a review paper, and as you can see, all these co-authors, Sam was able to gather um, people from different countries, different labs, uh, using a little bit different labels uh, to uh, people who study global identities, human identities, but also uh, citizenship, for example, and uh, write a paper together showing uh, what are the results, what are the similarities, um, actually a lot of them, in the research to make a point where are we at that moment, that was 2019, in this study. It's a very important paper, and some made it happen. 
Uh, last year, um, um, some uh, started another project that uh, um, that year. Uh, some approached me about um, making a special issue on global human identification, uh, also to allow young scholars to publish. Uh, so to you know to help um, spread the word about uh, uh, human identification uh, and help publish uh, uh, also young people and people from different countries. Uh, this is a, a research topic in Frontiers in Psychology. Uh, we also invited Justin Hackett uh, to be guest editors with us. Um, and uh, unfortunately, as you know, uh, in January this year, Sam uh, has passed away. So um, uh, we were thinking, uh, Justin and I discussed what, what we're going to do, but we decided to uh, go on with the project. Uh, it's going very well, actually. Uh, we're gonna. Um, we still have submissions open. The deadline is soon. So if you would like to join, you still can. Um, another project that uh, um, Sam inspired, uh, in a way, uh, I would say, is uh, Identification with All Humanity Lab and our website. And uh, it's, uh, uh, the team actually has started from the cooperation between Sam and, and I. Uh, and then we made this uh, website to spread the word about uh, the research, uh, there are scales there, uh, papers uh, to be downloaded, and also other materials I'm going to uh, talk about in a second, uh, to make it, uh, you know, also to gather information about um, human identities, global human identities in one place. Um, uh, as you can see, we have uh, a lot of people working uh, or in the lab, member, members of the lab or uh, collaborators. This is a different type of lab, not a lab which is uh, placed in one university or one uh, research institution. It gathered people from different countries, different universities. Uh, um, to These are people uh, who all work on uh, global identities uh, and uh, who would like to work together, who are interested in cooperation and uh, we make projects together. Right now, for example, we are in the middle of a project uh, in over 40 countries. So uh, this um, identification with our humanity lab and uh, the website is uh, still growing and um, alive. And some was, as you can see, important part of it. Uh, another thing you can find them there is um, video materials. So this is, for example, uh, Sam's last lecture, uh, which we posted there. Uh, Sam talking about all humanity as one, and uh, it's a 30-minute talk. Uh, you can have a chance to see Sam um, for the last time, recorded. Uh, Sam uh, and did not only research uh, um, human rights and global identities, but also embodied these values and these concepts. Uh, he was, uh, uh, as you can see here, for example, uh, he uh, and his wife Cheryl donated uh, uh, and worked for uh, World Human Rights Watch, but also Habitat for hum Humanity. Some was building houses. Uh, for example, uh, in, in this uh, project, uh, Doctors Without Borders. Um, Sam was uh, also uh, very active, not only in ISPB, but also in a local community. He was giving lectures, uh, writing letters to new newspapers, not only local, but also a little bit less local, as you can see. This is a New York Times one, uh, supporting human rights and, uh, uh, you know, uh, encouraging people to uh, make a stand uh, and uh, fight for important things. Um, um, he and his wife Cheryl were also very um, uh, wonderful hosts. They, uh, the, for, I visited uh, Western Kentucky University twice for research, also giving some lectures. They invited me to stay with them. They took care of me. They treated me as a family. I will never forget it. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, uh, and I'm so happy I was able to meet them both, uh, also uh, in a little bit less formal way. Uh, Sam was... Uh, um, a very warm, um, kind-hearted, wonderful person. I 
I would even say that that was the best human being I've ever met. Um, and I'm happy that, uh, that uh, I was able to meet him. Sam also visited Warsaw during ISPP. This is from one of the concerts, Chopin concerts in one of the uh, Warsaw parks. Uh, Cheryl and Sam loved it. Uh, and then pandemic uh, started. We hope that we can still see each other at some conferences or some other occasions. But unfortunately, this is the last image uh, of Sam I have. It's from one of the meetings we had, uh, team meetings online. Uh, and maybe you can see behind Sam, there is a poster. Uh, it's, a, it's a poster of a globe with one word on it. It says home. And that was very characteristic for Sam. And I think it's a good uh, final sentence for this talk. Um, I would like to invite uh, you tomorrow. There is a panel, uh, also commemorative panel for Sam. At the end, after pr our presentations, we will have time also to share memories and talk about Sam, um, about Sam and about his achievements um, uh, tomorrow at 10.45, also in this room here. Thank you very much. Katarina, that was that was wonderful. Thank you. It's it's um it's always a, a a a treasure to to bring back these memories, I think. And a treasure for us also to to get them from you. Felicia, do you want to say a few words about about Sam? No. Well, about Sam as well. Yeah. But about Jim. Hi. Yes. Uh, um, I, w I will talk about Jim Sedanius in a minute. I will also say that Sam McFarland was one of the finest human beings I've ever known. And I'm so privileged and lucky that I knew him because his sense of being inclusive and all humanity extended, as, as we heard about Herb Kelvin and Jerry Post, to his way of treating everybody here in ISPP. And we really owe him a debt for that. And it will be well to remember him in that regard. So I'm sorry to everybody for the difficulty of this um, symposium. And it's really appreciated that you're here because it's a hard thing, as you know, for all of us to do, um, but an important thing. So I was asked to say a few words about Jim Sedanius, and I will. Um, I'm not going to talk about his research in a huge lot of detail because he left us 300 and something papers and four books. And, you know, <laughs> we don't have all 90 years to do that. Um, in case you didn't know, you know, too much about Jim's background, you might have met him later. He grew up in New York City, only to his mother. He didn't know his father so much. Um, she cleaned houses for a living, which I didn't know until after he died. And he, and he um, didn't acknowledge that, but apparently um, Bo Uckerhammer told us last summer at, at Jim's online funeral how important Jim's mother and grandmother were to him. And I certainly think he must have gotten a sense that, um, a sense of fortitude and that they have to fight for what you want from seeing how they um, lived their lives coming from without an educated background and in a rather hostile world. So Jim did that. Um, he, he had a lot of political problems with the United States with the level of racism in the United States that was writ large to him in personal ways and in ways he observed. And so he actually left the United States for several years as a young man and he bummed around Northern Africa and Europe. There's some, he didn't tell me very much about those pursuits for many years. And I have to tell you that when I found out what he tried to do then, I don't blame him because I don't think he should be proud of it personally, but that's my judgment. But it was very formative of him um, in the sense that one of the things that he realized was that there's a way that the police and the military serve to control subordinated people in every society. And that was... Now, it may be overstated since he didn't travel to every society, but it was something that he observed in very different societies with very different governments. And that was a key insight later on in social dominance theory because he said, you know, American um, 
and some American political science and even international political science tended to make a big fuss over the distinction between, say, an official dictatorship or a monarchy or a, an authoritarian populist regime or a, de, or a liberal democracy. But actually, there are some very important similarities in how all of those regimes function. And that was sort of a key insight of him. And so. One of the ways um, that I appreciate his his intellectual point of view was that he was a keen observer of details, and he also thought about what was general and and um, and generalized some. So uh, so he ended up moving to Sweden and learning Swedish, becoming a Swedish citizen. He got his PhD at the University of Stockholm in 1977, which meant his third language is literal. And that was what everybody had to learn to work with him at first. Um, he had a Swedish wife and a Swedish child. After a while, he decided he didn't want to live in Sweden anymore, so he returned to the U.S., and that's where I met him when he was a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, he, he, he really kind of moved his family around the U.S. then several times to find better and better jobs, so he was looking for better opportunities. He was at um, NYU for a short time at Texas A&M for a short time. He checked out Princeton. He ended up um, in the psychology department at UCLA where he joined David Sears and Marilyn Brewer and Larry Bobo. And they were all three really good friends of his. And I, I'm sorry that I don't know how much they, I don't know whether they appreciate how much he, they really meant to him, but I knew him. Um, I visited UCLA a couple times during that period. and. One of the ways that it's not obvious to everybody that um, Jim likes you is he wants to do a bet with you about data. And he wants you to lose, but he's willing to take the bet and he'd like to do the study. So he did a bunch of sort of, if you will, sort of adversarial studies with David Sears back before, the, before they were called that because he was really inspired by symbolic racism theory, but in some sense he wanted it to go farther because he wanted it to be... Um, more culturally general, and so was thinking about things more. But he was—he very much enjoyed his time there. It was a big deal for him to decide whether to move away to Harvard because he was having such a great time at UCLA. But he was a little bit of a status monster, so I think, um, and he was—he it appealed to him to be in an interdisciplinary program at Harvard, and he had a great time there as well. And he had a um, in both UCLA. And at Harvard, he had a, a series of really phenomenal PhD students and postdocs. And they have been really um, lamenting his passing and talking about what a force of nature he was. And he really was. Um, I couldn't emulate Jim unless I stood up and I jumped up and down and I took all the rest of the time in the symposium till about eight o'clock at night because he never stuck with his time at ISPP. Um, having been the last person on his panel many times, I know this. Um, but he, um, and he really, and I think if you worked with Jim, you should feel flattered because he really cared to work with smart people. So if you didn't work with him, I can't say anything, I can't comment or anything about that. But if you, if, if you, if you did work with him, it meant he thought you were really smart because he just wouldn't work with anybody else. Um, so that's part of why he was able to be so productive. But it's but um, I have to say it's not the only reason. When I when I visited Jim in California, I was really amazed at how much coffee he could drink, like a pound a day, I would say. And um, I think in order to go to sleep at night, he had to drink quite a lot of red wine at night too. And it's, so it's no wonder he got liver cancer. But it's not not a nice thing to have happened to him. That was rough. That was a really rough time. And I remember well that I brought a book to ISPP while he was um, in treatment. And so he had to be isolated for many months. And many, many people wrote him very sweet messages, get well messages that I mailed to him when I got back home. So... Um, he needed to, and, and it turns out that even Jim, with all of his force of nature, um, 
momentum needed us. He needed to know that he mattered. And so I think he would be really thrilled to know that he, how much he is remembered and, and knows these things. Um, what else can I tell you? I can just give you a... Um, I mean, I could end there. There's, there's a few more notes that I had. My computer's dying with my other notes on it. He, was, he really believed very much in science. So it's funny that Jim was not an activist despite being very interested in inequality his whole career. He wasn't a believer. He wasn't an idealist. He, he eschewed Marxism exactly because he thought it was too idealistic. But he was a real believer in science. And he just, um, you know, he talked about that at every award he got, of which he got many. He, he wanted to test the ideas with data. He wanted to know if his theoretical intuitions were right, and he was willing to be informed by data. I wish that everybody was equally as well <laughs> willing to be informed by data as Jim is. I think we would have a more um, honest and dynamic discipline, actually, if if we really were. He he was somebody who believed in using multiple methods always, and so he so his early work he did a lot of ex, of um, surveys, and some of you know this because he's published really different studies, but from the same surveys for many decades, literally. But he also did a big variety of experiments with other um, people, and he was a very early advocate of all of us doing cross-cultural work of testing our ideas in more than one context. Far, f many years before anybody had popularized it, um, in, in a lot of the social sciences anyway. He was really an integrative thinker. He, he wanted us to have a general science. So even though he was very inspired by social identity theory, he was also inspired by realistic group conflict theory and Marxism and evolutionary theory and even a little bit of critical theory. Um, he incorporated all of that kind of thing in his thinking. And he did that to make an integrative and new theory. And I think that it's fair to say, and I have much admiration, that it that it really was integrative. It wasn't just rebranding and renaming the same old variable something else again. Um, he was willing to be unpopular, and he was willing to do things to get attention for his work, even if it wasn't going to be popular, because he really wanted to push the envelope of the field. He really wanted to um, be able to innovate and to go somewhere new. I think he, despite having, you know, not as long a life as we'd like, but, as long, but having a very long life and career, he always had a sense of urgency about what he was doing. And so it's no wonder he's so productive, you know, even on top of the coffee. Um, I'll tell you one more aside about him. So the last few years, he was in what was called phased retirement with Harvard, and the deal was that you sort of half retire and you half don't, so you can keep on doing some research and you keep on doing some teaching but not full time. And he and Miriam loved this because it meant that they got to spend fall in New England and then they would go back to California in December or so and stay there through August, and they enjoyed that lifestyle. So Jim was in phased retirement where... Um, a lot of people might check out. I think there's a funny term for it about um, something in place, professing in place. And he redid his multivariate stats class that he's taught for decades in R, just because that's the new thing that you should be able to do. So I, as, as with any of the previous speakers, there's no way to sort of to sum up or encapsulate or, or resurrect Jim, but I know that in a way I don't have to because I think he had such a large mind and such a large spirit and such a lot of love that I think he's still here with us and I think he'll always be with us at ISPP.
So I will be brief. I, I've been asked to speak about Bob Jervis. I knew Bob a little bit, so unlike some of the other people on the panel, I don't have a close association with him. I had a closer association with Jim, who, with whom I loved to argue. Jim was the best arguer. He loved a good argument. And I can't think of how many nights at ISPP we'd be sitting up late, drinking some of that wine, and yelling and screaming at each other. So um, it was a lot of fun. He was a fa fabulous arguer and never took it personally which is, I think, a wonderful skill, because he really was interested in testing out ideas um, and seeing how good you were at throwing it back at him and seeing if he could beat you. <laughs> this, was, this was definitely very competitive, so, and I'm a bit competitive too, so that was, <laughs> it was a good match. So let me just say a few things about Bob. Um, Bob was a major figure in international relations. I know at our meeting, we don't have that many people in international relations, but um, he was absolutely a seminal figure. He was also involved in ISPP at a certain time in the late 1980s. He was on our governing council, and he was also a program chair in the late 80s. So he, he played a role in ISPP. Um, but let me say more, Bob, when he passed away, uh, there was just an outpouring. Um, and I was fortunate enough, I worked with, uh, I had been a, a co-editor with Bob on the handbook of political psychology, the first one in 2003. Bob was responsible for the IR chapters. Uh, he, that was fine, he did that, and then he handed over to Jack Levy. So I'm, uh, Jack was kind enough to give me some more information about Bob. There's a tremendous amount of information out there. Um, but some of what I'm going to say is taken from the International Security Studies Forum, which comes from H. Diplo, the Diplomatic and International History Discussion Network. Um, and Bob Jervis was responsible for starting this ISSF forum, uh, in which people would share ideas and discuss things. So we remember Bob because of his extremely influential book, uh, Perception and Misperception in International Politics. That book has been cited almost 9,000 times. And what it did is it brought psychology to bear on elite decision making. This idea that elites are fully rational, fully perceive things, totally get it, they're making all of these well-considered rational decisions, Bob absolutely blew apart by taking lots of different angles from psychology and explaining how elites can misperceive, how they can misjudge, how they can misread signals. And this is incredibly important. And so one of the things I would say about Bob, like many of the people that we've been discussing, is that he also had huge impact beyond the academy. He cared about the world. I mean, he really wanted these ideas to be used. And I think, you know, I, I hope we can continue that in our current world. There's so much pressure these days to publish and, and less reward for practice. But in the end, we are supposed to be in this dialogue with the world in which we live to try and help others see things the way that we see them to come up with solutions to some of the problems we face. So, um, so Bob did way more than just political psychology in international relations, but he was very responsible for turning international relations towards psychology. I mean, he, he was the seminal figure who did that. I wish we could have more of our international relations colleagues here. We need these psychological insights into decision-making at all levels in our polities. Um, so let me say a few more things about Bob. I know we're going to run out of time. Um, so in this ISSF piece I'm speaking about, and you can find it online, there were 80 or 90 people raving about Bob. Um, so some people called him the Dean of Intelligence Studies. Um, one former student said that um, the fields to which his scholarship was seminal included political psychology, nuclear strategy, arms control, deterrence, regime theory, diplomatic history, intelligence analysis, and complexity theory. I mean, that's quite a list of very, very important topics. Um, so in that sense, he, someone called him a magpie. He read very widely across many different fields and wasn't just stuck in one lane. He really was trying to put these ideas together to help shed light on how these elite decisions were being made. Um, some said that he had an unquenchable curiosity 
Another characteristic I'd like to see all of us having, curiosity is really, really important. Um, and um, he, he, I remember his book on complexity is fantastic. I don't know it's been picked up as much, but it's about the complexity of systems. And I, if I recall, I was on the Book Award Committee. He won an award from the APSA, some political psychology section. But it was just underscoring how difficult it is also to intervene in the world with unintended consequences. So it was trying to illuminate that. So let me just say, um, uh, one of the ways in which he was very influential is, is that he was chair of the CAA's historical review panel. One of his things was history and political science. We need to understand history if we're going to get this right. We need to look at the past. Um, and he chaired that for 20 years. Um, and their goal, his goal on this committee was in part to try and open the CIA to release documents so that academics and others could get access to them, to understand what decisions were made, to make this more transparent. Apparently, the, the committee was disbanded by Donald Trump. So the CIA stopped thinking about history, apparently, at that point. But, um, but in any event, he, he served admirably for 20 years and obviously had very, very deep ties into the intelligence community and was universally loved by all of these people. By, he was trusted by the CIA. He was a, a trustworthy individual. So he was also a fabulous mentor, a consistent theme. So um, let me just try to read to you, I think, uh, here are some of the words that people in this whole series of comments made about him. Um, let's see if I can find those. They were just, oh, here we go. Uh, these are the kinds of words that the editor of this, um, of this piece said, words like thoughtful, modest, generous, honest, compassionate, humble, unassuming, self-effacing, anti-dogmatic, courteous, humorous, wonderful values, deep convictions. Um, a sense of epistemic modesty, strong moral compass, class act, good man. So we could probably use some of these terms for everyone that we're discussing here. And this is exemplary. These are the people we admire because they're not only very good scholars, they're very decent, good human beings. Um, and so not surprising, he was a great teacher, mentor, you know, the, his students just go on and on about him. So I'm going to give Teresa a few more minutes to sort of wrap up, but we should thank Teresa for allowing us to have these memories of people who have been so important to our society. Um, and I hope that we can continue doing something along these lines as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie. This is, this is great. And thank you, Felicia, for uh, sharing stories about personal stories as well um, that I didn't know. We are always lovely. Um, Leoni was mentioning words, and as she was mentioning words, I was thinking there's one word that I didn't hear, and that is giant. Um, giant. We are fortunate to be standing in the shadow of giants today. Um, in their absence, their shadow remains. Um, and um, I think we're honored, we're learning from these shadows uh, how to be how to try to achieve what they um, wanted us to achieve and what, they, what became reality for them. Um, it's always an inspiration. I see you in a, come up. Should I bring this? Yes. 